Good day and welcome back to another video about the liver. This time I will be sharing with you some information on the pharmacotherapy for hepatitis A, B, C, D and E. I hope to achieve four objectives today. First, to differentiate the five types of viral hepatitis by mode of transmission, risk factors and clinical presentations. Second, to describe the treatment goals for those infected with viral hepatitis. Thirdly, to recommend appropriate pharmacotherapy for acute and chronic viral hepatitis. Fourth, to recommend appropriate pharmacotherapy for the prevention of hepatitis. So hepatitis means inflammation of the liver, most commonly comes about because of a virus. These viruses tend to target the cells in the liver and when they get in and infect these cells, they tend to cause them to present abnormal proteins via their MHC class 1 molecules. At the same time, the immune cells infiltrate the liver and tries to figure out what's going on. The CD8 positive T cells then recognize these abnormal proteins and the hepatocytes then go through cytotoxic killing by the T cells and apoptosis. This typically takes place in the portal tracts and lobules of the liver. This cytotoxic killing of the hepatocytes is the main mechanism behind inflammation of the liver and eventually liver damage in viral hepatitis. The classic presentation of infectious hepatitis involves four phases. In phase 1, where the viral replication phase occurs, Patients are asymptomatic, but laboratory findings will demonstrate serologic and enzyme markers of hepatitis. In phase 2, prodromal or pre-icteric phase, patients experience anorexia, nausea, vomiting, alterations in taste, arthralgia, malaise, fatigue, urticaria, pruritus, and some develop an aversion to cigarette smoke. In phase 3, icteric phase, patients may note dark urine followed by pale coloured stools in addition to the predominant GI symptoms and malaise. Patients become icteric and may develop right upper quadrant pain with hepatomegaly. In phase 4, convalescent or post-icteric phase, the symptoms and icterus resolve and the liver enzymes appear to return to normal. However, the liver continues to enlarge and patients may be fatigued. Complications include the need for liver transplant, liver cirrhosis, hepatitis, coma and possibly death. Patients with hepatitis are likely subjected to liver function tests. The test results will often display raised liver enzymes 5 to 10 times higher than the upper normal limit. Higher serum amino transferase indicate inflammation, while higher than normal alkaline phosphatase indicates biliary injury. However, the more accurate parameters are bilirubin, albumin, and the ratio of prothrombin time to INR, which reflect the true hepatic function. Patients often also end up developing jaundice with a mix of both conjugated bilirubin and unconjugated bilirubin. The conjugated bilirubin leaks out when bile ductules are damaged or destroyed when the hepatocytes die. And since these hepatocytes are dying, Patients start to lose the ability to conjugate bilirubin, which makes it water-soluble. 
and so they end up with more unconjugated bilirubin. And now there's both conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin in the blood. Some of the water-soluble conjugated bilirubin gets filtered into the urine, giving it its dark color. Another common finding is increased urobilinogen in the urine. Urobilinogen is produced when bilirubin is reduced in the gut by intestinal microbes. Normally, most of that's reabsorbed and transported back to the liver to be converted into bilirubin or bile again. But if these liver cells aren't working right, that urobilinogen is redirected to the kidneys and excreted. So the patient ends up with more urobilinogen in the urine. If symptoms continue or the virus sticks around for more than six months, virus hepatitis goes from being acute to being chronic hepatitis. At this point, inflammation mostly happens in the portal tract. And if the inflammation and fibrosis keeps happening, this is a pretty bad sign since it might be progressing to post-necrotic cirrhosis. These patients often present with fulminant hepatitis. Its clinical presentations are encephalopathy and often patients end up with hepatic failure within 8 weeks. Now, there are 5 known types of hepatitis virus that have slightly different and unique properties. There is a possibility of a hepatitis G but we know less about it. Now, hepatitis A is transmitted through ingestion of contaminated food or water, in other words, the fecal oral route, and is known to be acquired by travelers. Hepatitis A or HAV is mostly always acute, and there is essentially no chronic HAV. If we are talking about serological markers, an HAV IgM antibody indicates an active infection whereas an HAV IgG antibody is a protective antibody that tells us that there has been a recovery for, from an infection or vaccination in the past. Hepatitis E virus is actually pretty similar to HAV in that they both share the same route of transmission, oral, fecal. Hepatitis E is most commonly acquired through undercooked seafood or contaminated water. It also doesn't have much of a chronic state. HEV IgM antibodies tell us that there's an active infection. HEV IgG antibody is protective and signals recovery. Two big differences to note though between these two that 1. Only HEV has the option for immunization and 2. HEV infection for pregnant women can be very serious and it can lead to acute liver failure, also sometimes called fulminant hepatitis. Alright, next up is hepatitis C virus. So this is transmitted via the blood. So it could be from childbirth IV drug abusers or unprotected sex. HCV usually does not move on to chronic hepatitis. And there are a couple of tests that we use to help diagnose HCV. One way is by enzyme immunoassay. In this case, we would screen for the HCV IgG antibody. If present, it doesn't necessarily confirm acute, chronic or even resolved infection because it isn't regarded as a protective antibody, just like it is with HAV and HEV. To get more specific confirmation, you might use recombinant immunoblot assay which helps confirm HCV.
If RNA levels begin to decrease, we know that the patient is recovering. If RNA remains the same, the patient probably has chronic HCV. Okay, next, hepatitis B. HBV is just like HCV in that it's contracted via the blood. So it's through the same routes like childbirth, unprotected sex and others. HBV, however, only moves on to chronic hepatitis in 20% of cases. But it also depends on the age that someone gets infected. For example, children less than 6 years old are most likely to get chronic infections, about 50%. And that percentage increases the younger they are. Also, chronic HBV is known to be linked to liver cancer. All these things make HBV and the serology of HBV a super important concept to understand. And kind of like HBV, Hepatitis C. We can use a variety of testing methods like PCR to look for certain markers, especially the HBV antigens and the presence or absence of each of these. Alright, so the key marker for HBV infection is the HBV surface antigen. And this is going to be like the supervillain in the story and this evildoer lives on the surface of the virus here and we can call it HB surface antigen meaning hepatitis B surface antigen. Another marker though is a core antigen meaning that these antigens come from the core of the virus HBC antigen. C here refers to core. Think of these like the dispensable henchmen that works inside the villain's evil factory. Finally, there's this other antigen called the E antigen, which is secreted by infected cells. So this is the marker of an active infection. These are like the byproducts of the factory. And along with the viral DNA, they tell us that it's replicating and infecting. Alright, so at the onset of infection during the acute phase, the surface antigen will definitely be present and will come up positive. And its factory will be pumping out both viral DNA and E antigen. At this point, the immune system produces IgM antibodies against the core antigens. When chronic, the host could present as sort of healthy and will likely have the presence of surface antigen, core antigen and no DNA or E antigen, basically saying that the supervillains there is just not replicating. And at this point, the host is contagious but there's lower risk. The other option is that they are ineffective, sorry, they are infective, meaning that the whole villain force is active along with an overwhelmed police force. This state increases the risk for post-necrotic cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. If either the IgM or IgG antibody are present, that indicates an active infection. So, in this case, the IgG is not a protective antibody. And that's a very brief overview of viral hepatitis.
this slide here should give, should give you a better overview. During the acute hepatitis phase, no specific emergency department treatment is indicated for viral hepatitis other than supportive care that includes IV hydration. A liver abscess calls for IV antibiotic therapy directed towards the most likely pathogens and consultation for possible surgical or percutaneous drainage. Admit patients with hepatitis if they are showing any signs or symptoms suggestive of severe complications. Admit and evaluate for hepatic encephalopathy any patients with altered mental status, agitation, behavior, or personality changes, or changes in the sleep-wake cycle. Other admission criteria that are suggestive of severe disease include a prothrombin time longer than 3 seconds, a bilirubin level greater than 30 mg per deciliter, and hypoglycemia. Treatment for acu acute hepatitis caused by hepatitis A virus is necessarily supportive in nature because no antiviral therapy is available. Hospitalization is warranted for patients whose nausea and vomiting places them at risk for hydration, for dehydration. Patients with acute liver failure require close monitoring to ensure they do not develop fulminant hepatic failure, which is defined as acute liver failure that is complicated by hepatic encephalopathy. As is the case for hepatic, for acute hepatitis A virus infection, no well-established antiviral therapy is available for acute hepatitis B virus infection. Supportive treatment recommendations are the same for acute hepatitis B as for acute hepatitis A. Nevertheless, most patients with viral hepatitis can be monitored on an outpatient basis. Certain patients may benefit from pharmacologic therapy. For chronic hepatitis B and chronic hepatitis C virus infections in particular, the goals of therapy are to reduce liver inflammation and fibrosis and to prevent progression to cirrhosis and its complication. Because the treatment regimes for hepatitis are being actively researched, Medication recommendations, indications and dosages are all subject to change. Ensure that patients maintain adequate hydration and arrange close follow-up care with primary care physicians. Instruct patients to refrain from using any potential hepatotoxins, for example, ethanol or acetaminophen. 
advise patients to avoid prolonged or vigorous physical exertion until their symptoms improve. Patients who are found to have to subsequently have hepatitis B or C infections should be referred to a gastroenterologist or hepatologist for further evaluation. They will likely be placed on interferons, antivirals and corticosteroids. Ideally, treatment of chronic hepatitis B would routinely achieve loss of hepatitis B surface antigen. Indeed, loss of hepatitis B surface antigen is associated with a decreased incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma and a decreased incidence of liver-related deaths in patients with hepatitis B virus-induced cirrhosis. At present, the key goal of antiviral treatment of HBV is the inhibition of viral replication. Agents currently used to treat hepatitis B include pegylated interferon alpha-2A and the oral nucleoside or nucleotide analogs. Typically, PEG inferon treatment is continued for 48 weeks for both hepatitis B E antigen positive and hepatitis E antigen negative chronic hepatitis. For hepatitis C infections, a combination of pegylated interferon and the antiviral ribavirin can provide sustained clearance of HCV RNA from the serum than monotherapy can do. There are four types of interferons. One has already been discontinued. So interferons are naturally produced proteins with antiviral, antitumor and immunomodulatory actions. Interferon alpha, beta and gamma may be given topically, systemically and intralesionally. The first type is interferon alpha 2b. The second is interferon alphacon. This was discontinued in 2013. The third type is the pegylated interferon alpha 2b. Fourthly, the pegylated interferon alpha 2a. Interferon has been the drug of choice for the treatment of hepatitis C for more than two decades. It is often used in combination with another drug, ribavirin. Successful interferon-based therapy results in a sustained virologic response and can improve the natural history of chronic hepatitis C and may reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with HCV-induced cirrhosis.
Antivirals inhibit viral replication. For example, semiclovir, entacavir, Ribavirin, Bosiprevir, these drugs are often administered in combination with PEC interferon alpha and ribavirin. The third pharmacologic agent is the corticosteroids. Examples of these include prednisone and prednisolone. Direct acting antiviral drugs form the newer therapeutic agent class groups. They improve treatment options for patients infected with hepatitis C, particularly. They're taken orally for 8 to 12 weeks and have become a standard because of their sustained virologic response rates of more than 90%. Simeprevir and Sobosfuvir were approved in 2013. Ladipasvir was approved in 2014. While Ombitasvir, Paritaprevir, and Ritonavir were approved as tablets, and Desabuvir as tablets in 2014. Albusvir and Krasoprevir were licensed in 2016. The co-infection of hepatitis D virus with hepatitis B virus has not been well studied. The only effective treatment for HBV, HDV infection, co-infection is PEC interferon. Antiviral nucleoside or nucleotide analogs have limited or no effect on HDV replication. The treatment for patients infected with hepatitis E virus infection is supportive in nature. Prevention is indeed better than cure. It's important to improve sanitization, have strict personal hygiene, and frequently hand wash to prevent transmission of hepatitis A. It's important to note that the virus is inactivated by household bleach or by heating. Travelers to endemic areas should not drink untreated water or ingest raw seafood or shellfish. Fruits and vegetables should not be eaten unless they're cooked or peeled. One of the most effective methods of preventing a hepatitis A infection is via vaccination. In 1996, the CDC recommended vaccination against HIV for the following individuals. People who are traveling to regions where the HIV is endemic, 
men who have sex with men, users of illicit drugs. And from 1999, the CDC recommended vaccination for children living in areas where there were high HAV infections. The inactivated HAV vaccines, Havrix and Vapta, are administered intramuscularly and they are given one month before the anticipated travel. For hepatitis B, there is vaccination available. Plasma-derived and recombinant HPV vaccines use hepatitis B surface antigen to stimulate the production of anti-hepatitis B antibodies in non-infected individuals. It is recommended for all infants as part of the usual immunization schedule to have the hepatitis B vaccination as well as adults at high risk of infection, for example, those receiving dialysis and healthcare workers. The recommended schedule for in infants consists of an initial vaccination at the time of birth before hospital discharge, a repeat vaccination at 1 to 2 months, and another repeat vaccination at 6 to 18 months. For adults, after the initial vaccination, a repeated vaccination is done at one month and then at six months. If twin rigs was given, basically the combined HAV HPV vaccine, then the schedule of immunization will follow hepatitis A. For post exposure prophylaxis, for those who are in contact with patients positive for hepatitis B surface antigen, HBIG plus HBV vaccine is given at the time of birth for those who were perinatally exposed, basically newborns who were in contact with a mother who is positive. Those who came in sexual contact with an acutely infected patient can be given HBIG plus HBV vaccine and those who are in contact with a chronic carrier sexually can be given HBV vaccine. For hepatitis C, D and E, however, there is minimal prevention. This is because there is no vaccine against HCV and also immune globulin is not proven to be effective to prevent transmission. For hepatitis D and E in particular, because HDV can infect patients only when HPV is present, transmission of hepatitis D can be decreased 
by effectively immunizing patients against HBV. Unfortunately, at this time, no means of preventing HDV superinfection in patients with chronic HBV is known. These are the references and materials that were used to create this video and you may want to have a look at some of the guidelines in particular. And with that, I've come to the end of my talk. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention and for watching and for listening. If you have any questions, do place them in the comment boxes and I'll take them as soon as possible. Lastly, do subscribe and hit the bell notification button. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.